Welcome to the Tuesday, December 13th, 2022 special meeting of the Governing Board. I'm going to call the public hearing to, or call this meeting to order at 7 p.m. Please let the roll call show that all members are present except for Mrs. Fisher. Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. I second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. I'm going to open the public hearing um, on revision number three of the 2021-22 expenditure budget. Do we have anybody here to speak to the third revision of the 2021-22 budget revision? Going once, going twice. Do you need to address Mrs. Mock? Good evening, President O'Brien, members of the board, and guests. This is a very rare um, budget revision for a prior budget year for us. This is allowed by Arizona Rise Statute 15-915 that allows us re to recapture budget capacity from a prior fiscal year. Um, when we made our final budget revision in prior to May 15 of 2022, we did say that we would not know our actual budget until after May 15th and that the numbers would not finalize until July. Actually, the final, final numbers do come out in November. And when we had the final report from the Arizona Department of Education, we learned that we had the opportunity to recapture some additional budget capacity. Um, a couple of those were, can come from data corrections from prior fiscal years where we can submit corrections to student data that will increase our budget capacity, but we did also have uh, an opportunity to recapture uh, a little over $800,000 and carry forward from fiscal year 21 into 22. So overall, we are able to increase the budget capacity from last school year, uh, just under $800,000 at about $784,000. And with that, I'll take any questions from the governing board. This item is on our regular agenda to correct Mrs. Mm -hmm. Mock. Okay. That is correct. So we'll only hear from the public now. So if there are no comments on item A, we will move to item B, public hearing on revision number one of the 2022-23 expenditure budget. Mrs. Mock. Oops. President O'Brien, members of the board and guests uh, in public and online, um, school districts are required to complete a December revision if their projected budget or projected enrollment um, has their budget greater than 2% where it actually should be. So when we adopt our budget in July, we are guessing what our ADM or our average daily membership will be for the school year. And if that guess is more than 2% greater where we land in November, you are required to do uh, a budget revision. I am pleased to say that that is not a requirement for us. This budget revision as well is an optional budget revision, and it's really just moving, um, the way I like to say it is that the money's going to be there regardless of whether we do this revision or not. We do still have to complete a budget revision by May 15th for this budget as well. Um, this budget revision will just line some of the numbers up in the correct places so that when ADE publishes our budget, uh, reports on a monthly basis, it will line up more cleanly and make it much easier for us to determine um, what our budget capacity is as we go through the school year. Thank you for that information, Mrs. Mock, and for making sure that our budgets will line up and be more clean. Do we have any comments on our revision number one of the 2022-23 budget, expenditure budget? Again, it looks like we have no comments. So with that, I would take a motion to adjourn this special meeting at 7.04 p.m. So moved. And a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. And the meeting is adjourned. I will now call to order the regular governing board meeting on Tuesday, December 13th, 2022 at 7.05 p.m. Please um, 
Let the roll call reflect that all board members are here except for Mrs. Fisher. If you would please stand if you are able to join me with, in the Pledge of Allegiance and then a moment of silence. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Um, I would ask that the governing board adopt the agenda. A second. We have a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed, please say nay. Motion passes unanimously. We will do um, item three, outgoing board member service recognition, Dr. Finch. All right, thank you. I have the privilege of uh, honoring our two exiting board members on their last meeting. We have uh, Ms. Reed has served one term, Ms. O'Brien has served two terms. I just want to thank them, obviously, for their service uh, to Deer Valley Unified School District. We are not in a better spot than we are today than we've ever been. 92% well, of our schools are A or B, 25 out of our 40 are A schools. We won 50 state championships last year. That's the most we've ever won. Uh, uh, we are continuing to be the epicenter of education in the state, and that's exciting to be a part of that. We uh, obviously have some buddies, new buddies that are showing up here soon. So I do have some homework for you. Um, as TSMC moves into our neighborhood, uh, really the big brother of Intel, it's going to be changing our district. And uh, as you uh, transition back again to full community members and your other positions that you work for and in, I just wanna make sure that you can remind our community and uh, continue to be advocates for Deer Valley as we uh, begin our hyper growth here soon. Uh, to, uh, if you were part of a couple days ago, the TSMC opening celebration, the uh, first tool in uh, which many uh, high ranking officials showed up, including the president of the United States. Uh, he talked, uh, they talked about uh, where uh, TSMC is headed and it happens to be uh, a pretty big event that's gonna change our district forever. Uh, they announced they are going to double or triple their investment from about 12 billion to 40 billion. So that's going to be a big change for us. Uh, the students have started to arrive by airplanes. We uh, had another plane arrive today. About 300 students are in this first wave and about half of them are already in school. So my homework for you is to continue to uh, help support Deer Valley as we change and adapt to uh, the many variables that are coming our way. But I just wanna thank you for your years of service. We have a uh, crystal apple in here that's engraved with your service on it and we have the most coveted item, the lifetime pass to come watch the sports, our, our fine arts. And we had uh, students here from Mountain Ridge and uh, part of the, the state champion uh, marching band uh, do our uh, Christmas uh, celebration an event, we wanna thank them for their service as well. Uh, appreciate when the kids always show up and help us out. So again, thanks Ms. Reed, thanks Ms. O'Brien for your service, we appreciate it. <laughs> 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 
Friday Night Lights forever. Nice. Thank you very much, Dr. Finch. Um, go to our first um, district reports, the finance reports by Mrs. Mock. Thank you. Thank you, President O'Brien, members of the board and guests, and a special thanks to Dr. Finch for teeing up the enrollment report this evening. Um, this enrollment report takes us through the 77th day of the school year. It was our last report for November on November 30th. And contrary to the reports that we have had earlier in the school year, we are now showing a slight increase in enrollment compared to this time last year, with I think maybe just the first wave um, of students coming um, from TSMC represented in this report. And uh, so we did have an increase of 0.2% from the same time last year with total enrollment of uh, 32,831 students. And with that, I will take any questions about enrollment. Any questions, board members? Hearing none, please move to your next report, Mrs. Mock. Thank you, President O'Brien. For our next report, we will present the November 2022 M&O budget report. Similar to the report last month, while we are hanging on and waiting for the legislature to make a determination on the aggregate expenditure limit, AEL. Um, we do have all of our current expenses and encumbrance represented in the report, but we are not projecting any true remaining balance or carry forward at this time, uh, holding on to any unspent or unencumbered funds to potentially go toward the $46.7 million uh, current year budget cut that Deer Valley would face if the aggregate expenditure limit were not corrected prior to March 1st of 2023. As we stated last month, we will state again this month, we fully believe that the legislature is going to take action prior to that, probably not until January or February, and so we do still have to wait a couple months to see if um, what that's going to look like. But there is some additional potential carry forward at the bottom of the report, and we will hear later in the meeting, um, 13 million of that were funds that we did not allocate for the school year yet as it was um, allocated to us very, very late in the budget season last year. And we've been working with our negotiated solutions team to determine where those funds should be allocated um, should the aggregate expenditure limit be corrected. And with that, I will take any questions on the m and budget report. Any questions? Mrs. Paperman. So the 13 million uh, is being discussed, like where it's going to be allocated. So I'm just hoping that uh, the committee uh, will be looking in staff retention. Uh, uh, we need to provide more support with salary, especially uh, with the way the economy is right now. Mrs. Paperman, President O'Brien, members of the board, if that is um, what you were hoping the committee could do, please be very patient uh, in a little bit of time, in about 10 minutes, 20 minutes, depending on how long the reports take. But before we leave this evening, you will have that recommendation. And uh, we hope that you will be happy because that is the direction that we are going. Mrs. Ordway? In all, uh, well, a little bit of, maybe it's called sarcasm. Did you guys? From the finance areas, I'll ask Santa for that um, change and maybe a permanent one so we don't have to do this every year. <laughs> Repeatedly. Okay, thank you. I know it's on my Christmas list. All right, thank you so much, Mrs. Mock. All right, our next report is the Futures Report update from Dr. Zerbach and um, Dr. McCusker. Okay, uh, good evening, President O'Brien, members of the board, Dr. Finch. Uh, very pleased to be here with you this evening for our annual futures update. Uh, with me this evening are several members from the district office as well as our campus leaders uh, to help me present. Uh, specifically this evening, we have uh, Dr. McCusker, Dr. Galligan, uh, myself, we have Mrs. Moffitt, and then we have three of our site leaders here um, that are right behind me. So we have uh, Mr. Galetti, uh, Mrs. Basil, and Mrs. Graham. Okay, this evening we have uh, four main questions that we will address. The first two will be addressed quite briefly in the initial slides, with the bulk of the presentation focusing on the third bullet point, which is what work has been accomplished um, heretofore. Okay. 
Okay, with respect to the first question, making sure that there's context for our presentation tonight in terms of what is the Futures Report and why it is important. Uh, you will recall that the Futures Report was an audit that was performed by the Futures Group, and that was in 2019. And when they did that particular audit, they did a very extensive data and document analysis, and they also conducted a number of interviews. And so we have presented this slide before, but you can see just how expansive uh, the interview process was and the focus group process. You can see that hundreds and hundreds of stakeholders, whether it be teachers, administrators, classified staff, parents, um, office staff, and from the district office as well, that many, many, many folks were interviewed to make sure that everyone's input uh, was gathered for this particular report. The report was quite lengthy. It went into detail in some parts, and in other parts, it high level uh, types of recommendations and findings. And Dr. McCusker will go into more detail about the direction that was provided by the Futures Report. Dr. McCusker. All right, good evening, uh, President O'Brien, governing board members, and community members. Sorry about my microphone. Uh, the Futures Group did conduct um, an extensive uh, assessment, as Dr. Zerbach has addressed. And they included three um, domains, including organizational considerations, continuum of supports, as well as a financial review. And you can also see examples of driving questions. So they really focused on early intervening supports, MTSS, as we call it in Deer Valley, uh, service delivery in aspects of direct service delivery from special ed teachers, as well as related services. And then the third prong really focused on our relationship and partnership with behavioral health agencies. Thank you, Dr. McCusker. Three work teams were established to accomplish the work that was outlined in the report. These three work teams are listed here. The behavior and service delivery team, which has a sub-team to it with the essential academic and social behaviors group. We also had an academics work team and then finally a human capital work team. And with that, I will get to our first work team update and that will be with Dr. Galligan who will talk to us about the progress that has been made with MTSS. Dr. Galligan. President O'Brien, members of the board, Dr. Fink, and guests. The academic section of the Futures work uh, was truly about consistency of uh, verbiage and language. Um, we brought this information to you over the past few years. Our goal continues to be to ensure that all students across each of our schools learn at those high levels, and our goal is grade level or higher each year. Um, our next steps, as you can see there, are to ensure our instructional minutes at K-8 are met and that we have efficiencies across those learning uh, minutes for all instructional blocks for our tiers one, two, and three. And at high school, ensure that tier two and tier three interventions are in place consistently across our high schools and used with fidelity to reduce learning gaps. If you notice right here, we have had an MTSS playbook for probably seven years. However, it has gone through a, a pretty um, extensive revision up to this point, and it does include common information about the site intervention team and the referral process, simply because if you look in the blue, that was the recommendation from the futures team. It was to establish policies and procedures and blueprints for common languages, forms, and team compositions. So we have this year across most all, if not all, of our schools site intervention teams, and, and their responsibility really is to identify students who are in need of Tier 2 and Tier 3 interventions, and they work closely with our campus intervention coordinators. You can see on the top right, we did have some work with Chris Hansen, who is a Solution Tree site intervention team expert, and he helped us refine the work that we're doing at the campus level. Thank you, Dr. Galligan. And our last MTSS slide focuses on MTSSB. As you know, in the board updates, I've kept you informed of the progress that has been made in this area. But beginning really in May of last year, 
uh, the campus leaders expressed a desire for a point of emphasis to be placed on the behavior side of the MTSS system, and we have done that this year. We've done that through a variety of our congregate meetings, whether it be in pre-K-12 level or region, and also on one-on-one -on -one, uh, individual sessions with our campus leaders. This work with MTSSB draws upon the framework of the behavior solutions uh, solution model, and we will continue to work with our campus leaders on establishing strong MTSSB systems throughout this school year and next year as well. And with that, we'll move to our second work team, which will be the focus of tonight, and it is the Behavior Service Delivery Work Team. And with that, I'll pass it to Dr. McCusker. Good evening again, uh, President O'Brien, governing board members, and community members. Uh, this evening, I'm going to encapsulate our Behavior Service Delivery Work Team um, and what we've been working on from 2018 until the present. Uh, this should be a familiar continuum for you. Uh, we refer to this as our LRE continuum in Deer Valley Unified School District. And this really encapsulates a purview of what services we provide. Dr. McCusker, could you just, for everybody's benefit, um, explain what LR LRE is? Absolutely. Uh, LRE is the least restrictive environment. So that is an obligation that we provide under uh, federal guidelines from the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Thank you, President O'Brien. Uh, what you can denote here is by the circles, we've really focused in the past few years on developing our specialized learning centers. Our learning centers are locations where our students on IEPs have an opportunity to obtain service delivery from qualified professional uh, special ed teachers. And so our specialized learning centers have really focused more on developing perspective and supports that are very specific to students' individual needs. With that development, uh, we also did some work team um, alignment for a positive intervention classroom. And our PIC classroom, as you may remember, Governing Board, uh, was presented um, in our previous Futures presentations. And this was a positive intervention classroom to focus on support for K-3 students, whether they be on an IEP or whether they be general education, to really go along the strands of our MTSS support that Dr. Galligan articulated earlier. Now we are looking forward to developing even more specialization to provide in-depth support for our students on IEPs. And this is what we're referring to as our specialized regional programs. This will allow our students who are on IEPs who require more intensive needs and supports to obtain those specific um, supports within a very structured learning environment. So this evening, we're going to look deeper into those areas. And as you can see, those are both green areas which denote growth. Uh, we are growing in these areas in our LRE continuum. Thank you, Dr. McCusker. At this point, I will hand it over to our three members of BLT. I would like to give them a special uh, thank you for the work they have done on top of their uh, regular jobs that they have. Uh, they have put in many, many hours of extra work uh, to help co-lead this uh, particular effort. So many thanks to this group, and I'll hand it over to, I believe, uh, Principal Basil. <laughs> it's green. Green is go. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, yes, so BLT stands for Building Leadership Team, not a sandwich, um, and we represent all um, building level leaders in Deer Valley, and our administration teams provide feedback to BLT frequently in different settings, whether that be um, at our district level meetings or in our region meetings or through um, other conversations that we have, and our goal is to, um, along with the input that the principals receive from their staff, and, and um, parent community, um, they bring that back to us. And then from there, we represent and have communication with district leadership and Dr. Finch. So you can see um, this timeline is just a snapshot because it ends September 30th, um, but you have the full printout of the work that we started back in September. So the futures, even though it was um, provided, the data was provided in 2019, um, administration continues to ask because they do feel that it is still relevant today and that the progression of the future's input is very important to the needs of our students and our staff and our system. So in the beginning of September, we met with Dr. Finch as part of our 
monthly board meetings and presented the topic again of progressing forward in this next phase of the growth of regionalized or specialized programming. And out of that, we then began to um, set up a work team and begin to advocate for the next steps in the futures report. So we looped out to region principals and continue to meet with the board and a steering team. And you can see this process as we go along that the most important thing, and if you go to the next slide, the most important piece for us was frequent communication and loop out. We talked a lot about how we remain in our sandbox of what is within our scope and where we need our district leadership team and support to um, help move forward all the time focusing on what's best for students and what's best for our staff and our families. So you can see here this frequent stakeholder communication. We started with a work team and then we brought in focus groups with certified and classified itinerant staff and stakeholders from K-12 and then always gathered back to our steering team to continue to plan and then our BLT work team and then Dr. Finch. The cycle continued for three work team meetings and two focus groups and also then a staffing loop out to two specific regions once we got to that point. So there will be more information on that, but now I'm going to have the rest of my team talk specifically in detail about the work teams and collecting and valuing input. Good evening. Our purpose was to act in a timely manner for our students and staff while also gathering ideas and input futures recommendations. We posted for a district work team being thoughtful to include positions that represent each employee group, region, itinerant staff, and transportation. During focus groups, we asked three questions in order to gather helpful input. These groups included volunteers and recommendations from certified teachers K-12, all principals from each region, itinerant team leads, paraprofessional team leads across the district, and parents from two regions to date. Next slide. Okay. Our very first work team meeting on September 29th focused on the purpose and scope of our work and reviewed the futures report recommendations. We completed a focusing three activity that identified what we need and possible agreed upon changes. Everyone was allowed just two hand raises, which was really hard when you look at that very long list of things in front of you that everyone came up with. So they were given two hand raises for what was most important in that list. Um, and we came up with the focusing three. And we narrowed it down from 10 to three. This is how we came up with the big three. And these drove the work for the work team over the next three months. And excuse me, I forgot to charge my Chromebook last night, so I'm going to look on from Mrs. Basil. Uh, we, we continued with our next two work team meetings first in October, and we had captured a lot of good momentum after our first work team meeting. It was a fantastic and diverse and broadly representative group from across the district, um, and it was very good for us to get uh, the input and the ideas and capture the wisdom of those uh, certified, classified, and on the ground front lines, uh, service providers and teachers who work with our media students day in and day out. Uh, we were able to um, really drill down our focusing three and work team meeting two and come up with some mock regions and uh, a, a sample of data that we were looking at who might fall into certain criteria for specialized programs, given a set of uh, criteria and data that we use from student support services. Uh, the one feedback we had from the first meeting was they wanted more time and more food. So we brought both uh, to work team meeting two and three, and that, that helps productivity. Work team meeting three was right before the Thanksgiving break, and again, we were back at Union Park and the, the same group, it was right before Thanksgiving break, but we had a, a phenomenal turnout. And after getting more feedback from all of our stakeholders, 
looping out to uh, K-12 principals and bringing back that information to the work team, we started to look at what would some uh, model site characteristics be that would house specialized programs from the lens of uh, leadership, administration, physical facility characteristics that would need to be put in place, staffing and training characteristics, and what do we want those programs to look like. And then we were able to develop some focus group questions and ideas for our parents and community stakeholders, which we were actually able to start implementing last week when we had our first parent focus group, uh, actually last Thursday, right across the parking lot here in the Innovation Center at Aspire. Thank you, uh, Mr. Galetti. Uh, Dr. McCusker. So what comes next? As we look at potential uh, for specialized programming in Deer Valley Unified School District, based upon all the data that the site principals have presented and the work team feedback, as well as focus group feedback, uh, we have ascertained that potential regions could be our Barry Goldwater and Deer Valley High School regions. Um, again, these have been identified as potential regions and the criteria that was set forth uh, was again based on stakeholder input as well as data. So as we look forward into years 2024 and beyond, uh, our other regions, our remaining regions, Boulder Creek, Mountain Ridge, and Sandra Day O'Connor regions will also be a part of the implementation plan. So discussions that could be forthcoming. Uh, we need to certainly consider staffing and working in concert with our human resources department uh, is something that is uh, forefront in our decision making, as well as identified specialized locations within those regions, and further development of specialized program, entrance, maintenance, and exit criteria is something that will always need to be refined um, and improved upon. And then again, um, foremost, comprehensive communication plans for all stakeholders. Uh, communication is something that needs to be consistent um, to communicate with all stakeholders, inclusive of parents. This is also additional work for the work team where we focused on our partnership with Vista Peak, our public day school in Deer Valley Unified School District, CPI, which is our response, nonviolent crisis intervention, our response to students that require uh, verbal de-escalation as well as physical intervention, and then of course our Boys Town, um, which has now been identified in our Barry Goldwater region. We have identified campuses. So these are all of the things that we have implemented for the 2023 and 23 school year. We will continue uh, to maintain our development of our CPI programming, including a trainer of trainer models, our Boys Town trainer of trainer models, and also build upon Boys Town Consultancy, uh, which provides feedback directly to Boys Town campuses. Um, as well as we move forward into 23 through 2025 timeline, of course, we were always doing um, a sustainability and framework check of what we're doing well and what we need to refine, including our specialized classroom management and wall managed schools. Um, and that is through our Boys Town um, comprehensive input. Thank you, Dr. McCusker. The next two slides, again, capture the essence of this work in terms of being a multi-year effort. You can see, again, starting in the 2018-19 school year with the features report, and then you can see in each year the different layers that have been added in to this implementation effort. And that, again, continues on this next slide, and you can see the specialized learning center work that has been articulated to you and how it's captured in 2022-23 and then the years going forward. And with that, I will ask Dr. McCusker uh, to speak to the human capital work and the progress that has been done as there is some very exciting uh, news there. Dr. McCusker. I have a big smile on my face because this slide brings me much joy as well as human, um, human resources. This is something we endeavored upon this year. It's a partnership between human resources and student support services to really fill the vacancies, the existing vacancies that we have within our school district. So looking to human capital, uh, who better to do it than Deer Valley Unified School District? We have a large group of experts, um, and again, um, with rigor and excellence, we have been able to develop a teacher prep program 
under the leadership of Stephanie Eubank, our coordinator, who has done a phenomenal job. Um, and we are getting ready. We have com almost have completed our first cohort, our first semester with our first cohort for special educators. As well, we're getting ready in January to start our second uh, cohort for special education and our first cohort for general education. So what a celebration and huge kudos to our team members who are a part of this process. I do have some exciting numbers for you in our special ed cohort. Uh, currently, we have 13 teachers um, that are impacting 11 schools. And think of the impact that has for students. For semester two, which begins in January, our special ed cohort will have 10 teachers that will impact seven campuses in Deer Valley. And our elementary ed cohort, uh, which is inaugural and our first one, we will have four general ed teachers on three campuses. So again, this is a celebratory slide. Um, what a victory for our students, our staff, and our students. And although it may pain me to say it, I will uh, say kudos to Jenna Moffitt and her HR crew uh, for their work with this, as it certainly, um, their collaboration with Student Support Services is paying off uh, in this area, and it will continue to pay dividends for uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of kids in the very near future. And with that, President O'Brien, uh, it concludes our futures update, and we would be happy to entertain questions now. Thank you so much, Dr. Zerbach. And just for clarification, it only pains him because he's so competitive and wishes to be the best department in the district, and so he had to compliment somebody else. So congratulations, Jenna Moffat. I never thought he would do that on the record. So it's a stellar night. I will give him one point for that. All right. Thank you, Dr. Finch. That does keep me in the lead. <laughs> oh, now we know he was sucking up for brownie points. Mrs. Ordway? Dr. McCusker, I was wondering when you said that we're uh, looking at Barry Goldwater to start as that region, does that mean that it is only including students that would be in that region, or are we going to include students throughout the district? Mrs. Ordway, uh, President O'Brien, excellent question. So when we look at um, identifying the regions, we are specifically looking within that region. Uh, what we are calling a flip uh, would be for that region to really look at the students um, that are residents within that region uh, to identify specific students that meet that criteria that require that more intensive intervention within the Barry Goldwater region. So with our um, open enrollment, if indeed we only provided those services in that specific region, um, would you not think that parents would open enroll to a school in that region so they could receive the services? Mrs. Ordway, President O'Brien, as we look at open enrollment, um, the students that are specifically identified for the specialized programs, those are going to be IEP team decisions. Um, so it is not necessarily programmatic where you can open enroll into that program. An IEP team is making those uh, decisions in the most appropriate um, service delivery for that specific student. However, um, if an open enrollment request comes forward, uh, we would consider an open enrollment request as we do all the time. Uh, we would base it upon um, the capacity considerations that we do for any student in Deer Valley. Thank you. Other questions, board members? Mrs. Paperman? So my question is uh, that we have programs as Boys Town, Social Emotional Learning, PBIS. Uh, do we have the curriculum or resources on the website so parents can review? Uh, President O'Brien, uh, Ms. Paperman, the programs are listed on the ALS website. There is a section uh, for parents to find which programs are at uh, which schools. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Reed? And then can you remind me, when, um, a, when a school is using Boys Town, I know that parents are a huge part in making sure that that's successful. Um, and we're still doing parent training and communication as far as what Boys Town is, is correct? President O'Brien, uh, Mrs. Reed, yes, you are very correct. That Boys Town implementation, whether it is a Fidelis process and we want it to be successful, our parents are integral to its success. 
Uh, so part of the Boys Town model, well, whether it is well-managed schools or specialized classroom management, is inclusive of parents being a part of the process and parent training, uh, which includes conversations and continuous communication. Okay. Thank you for the presentation, and um, it's exciting to see the strides we're making, and congratulations on the new te the teachers in the program. That's very exciting, especially um, for special ed. Uh, not that I don't appreciate all teachers, but we know that that's a hard-to-fill area, so um, kudos to you, Dr. McCusker, and of course you, Mrs. Moffitt. Um, very exciting programs. Thank you for the presentation. And with that, we will move to call to the public. Mrs. Ordway, will you read the admonishment? No. The board invites public comment on the district's business in general and on any agenda item in specific. All speakers must observe the rules of decorum. Speakers must fill out a card listing name, address, and topic, and hand it to the board secretary prior to the president calling the meeting to order. Speakers must make their Comments in no more than three minutes, and you guys will have your full three minutes tonight. If necessary to accommodate all speakers, the overall limit, the board president may limit your time. Constructive criticism is an order, rudeness, vulgarity, disruptive conduct, or remarks disrespecting personal dignity are not in order and will not be allowed. Under the Arizona Open Meeting Law, the governing board cannot discuss or act on any items not listed on the agenda. Board members may respond to criticism made by a speaker, ask a staff member to review a matter, or ask that a matter be put on a future agenda. And with that being said, we have Mr. Bayer, Mr. Beach, Mrs. Luz, Los, I always say that wrong, and I believe in Mrs. Collins. <clears throat> If you'll please state your name for the record, then your time will begin. Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you, Mr. Superintendent and members of the board. To start off, I have something I will need to Excuse read. me, but we need you to state your name Pardon for me? the record. I, have some, I need some clarification. As I do this, I'm not allowed to use the name of any member of the board. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so I'll no. have to do something. That'll make it awkward, but that's all right. So go ahead. My name is Ron Bayer, by the way. This is a resolution of the Republican Party of Legislative District 28. This was dated on ninth, the 19th day of September, 2022. This is to the Deer Valley Unified School District and the Deer Valley Board. Whereas, and I can't use a name, so I'll use an acronym or a pseudonym, Cruella O'Biden, is a precinct committeeman in the Arizona Republican Party residing in Maricopa County. And whereas Maricopa County Republican Committee bylaws, section two, PCs, subsection E, duties of PCs, item seven expresses that a PC is charged with helping elect worthy Republican candidates. And whereas on or about June 5th, 2022, Cruella O'Biden circulated a nomination petition for Craig Beckman, candidate for the board member, Deer Valley Unified School District, and a registered Democrat. And whereas, on or about June 5th, 2022, Cruella O'Biden circulated a nomination petition for Stephanie Simisek, a candidate for board member, Deer Valley Unified School District, and a registered Democrat. And whereas several qualified Republican candidates for Deer Valley Unified School District were available to support at the time. And whereas Cruella O'Biden was censured by the former Legislative District 15 GOP committee on January 22nd, 2022 for her actions contrary to the public interest and for her support of progressive Democrat indoctrination goals within public education. Therefore, be it resolved that the Arizona LD28 Republican Committee censures Cruella O'Biden, be it further resolved that we, the Republican Committee of LD28, demand her immediate resignation as an Arizona Republican Precinct Committeeman, and if failing to do so, call on the Maricopa County Executive Committee to remove her forthwith. In witness where, whereof, 
proposed by precinct committeemen and voted on during a regular legislative district meeting. This was passed by a unanimous vote. That means you have been denounced by the Republican Party. And I think you know who I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker, please step up to the microphone. If you please state your name, then your time will begin. Thank you, Mark Beach, Madam President, board members, and guests. Um, I am the first vice chairman for Legislative District 2 for the Republican Party. We passed the exact same resolution on July the 25th of this year. Um, just as a pro forma matter, because as a member of the party and claiming to be a member of the party, it's important to espouse and adhere to the actual tenets of and duties of a precinct committeeman. My understanding is you're not anymore, so it's uh, kind of a moot point, but it's being read into the record. That, that with Legislative District 2, we also uh, executed the same censure. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker, Mrs. Lowe's. Please state your name for the record and then your time. Hi, I'm Amanda Lowe's. Good evening, Governing Board President O'Brien, Governing Board members, Dr. Finch, and guests. My name is Amanda Lowe's and I have been a part of this district since 2004 when I started third grade at Stetson Hills, then moving on to SDHS, coming back and student teaching at Barry Goldwater in 2018. I started teaching eighth grade math at Stetson Hills in 2018 and moved over to DBHS in 2020. Throughout this time, I have had a major supporter, my mom, Ann O'Brien. While in school at Stetson, she was the PTSA president and substitute teacher. Throughout high school, I only let her be a mom out of fear of embarrassment, the worries of a high school girl. She still came to all my volleyball games and volunteered to be chaperone for some field trips. And while student teaching and teaching, she was governing board member for our district and at some points the president of the board. I was always used to my mom being involved and looking back, I could not be more grateful for it. While teaching, I have been known as a teacher, but quickly that was always followed with the governing board member's daughter. I knew it was a risk to come back and work in the district my mom was heavily involved in, but the work and time she's put in is incredible. It was more important to me to come back and serve in the district I attended and work with the teachers that inspired me to be a teacher than any comment, tweet, or Facebook post made about me as a repercussion of being the governing board member's daughter. Before, during, before, during and after COVID, my mom did what she could to show all the schools in the district her support by visiting schools, attending sporting events, attending special events, and anything else she could go to to show her full support to the schools, administrators, teachers, and most importantly, the students. When my mom commits to something, she puts her 110% effort into it, and that is exactly what she has done for the past eight years. It is hard for some people to understand certain things about this posi position, such as it not being paid, the amount of time it takes, and that you have multiple sets of people you are considering when making every decision. And that includes students, st certified staff, classified staff, parents, community members, and all other constituents. During COVID, a difficult time for all, some people thought her decisions as a governing board member didn't actually impact her. But she called me one day and said, I have to point out that my daughter teaches in the district. I was fine with that because I was proud to say that was my mom. So mom, governing board president, Ann O'Brien, I would like to say thank you for the past eight years of your service. Even though some people might disagree with me, I think you absolutely did the best job you possibly could with the cards you were dealt with at certain times. I would also like to extend a thank you to Ms. Julie Reed for your service the past four years as well. It seems like it was just yesterday we were all sitting at Peter Jungle the night of election night in 2018 to see if you both were voted onto the board. Again, I cannot thank you both, both enough for your time and dedication to this district. Your daughter and future granddaughter are always very proud of you. Please state your name for the record and then your time will begin. Stephanie Collins. Good evening, President O'Brien, Dr. Finch, and members of the board. I wanted to specifically address both Mrs. O'Brien and Mrs. Reed in this space tonight. For the past eight years, Mrs. O'Brien, and four years for you, Mrs. Reed, 
I have come to deeply respect your commitment and your dedication to DVUSD and all of its stakeholders. You have served with both integrity and class in everything you have done. You have served not under political lenses, but under the lenses of people. From ensuring that students have food to eat over long breaks, through your organization of food drives, to securing others with holiday gifts they would not have had outside of the efforts of the community to bridge the gap in the resources to showing up for celebrations and always having the needs of the students at the forefront in everything you do while expecting nothing in return, to making your attendance at meetings a priority over anything else and so much more. As a parent, I have personally respected the willingness of you, Mrs. O'Brien, to answer questions I have posed while simultaneously ensuring transparency on educational policies and procedures. I never walked away from a meeting with you feeling confused or conflicted. I believe that is a testimony to the kind of position, the kind of person you hold and the position you are. Mrs. Reed, I recall a statement you made a few years back when you said the neighborhood school is the heart of each community. And that is something that I never forgot. While I do believe that to be truth, I also believe it runs deeper than that. Our campuses are only as good as our leadership, and that is something I profoundly respect in you. Your ability to lead and make decisions not rooted in what others believe, but what you feel to be right. It's certainly not easy to come under scrutiny and stand in the light of what others perceive about you. You both have exhibited the grit and the grace, not of simply an elected official, but a true servant of the people. You came here to serve and not be served. There's a difference. You have served DVUSD, and it is better because of people like you. I wish you both the best of luck on your new endeavors. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We'll move to our next agenda item. Are you sure you're okay? All right, I would ask that the governing board approve the recommended 2023-2028 strategic plan as presented. I second. I have a motion and a second. And for this item, we will go to Dr. Tunis. Good evening, President O'Brien. I'm Dr. Finch, members of the board. Um, tonight, I am back to um, clarify some questions that came up from the preview and then to answer any questions or um, clarify any content that you might have. I think we have a presentation. At the um, last governing board meeting, it was asked a little bit, or since then, I've been asked about the process of the portrait of a graduate. So I wanted to provide you with some additional information. Um, on this slide here, I have um, posted the purpose, which we identified with our stakeholder groups, which was essentially to identify the skills and attitudes our students would possess in order to be ready for their future, whether it's with college, careers, or within their communities. And so th th these were always the last two questions that we asked in our focus groups. Um, we did it a couple of different ways with our parents and our students. We provided them with paper and gave them time to talk and collaborate with one another and come up with suggestions. We asked them um, what are the skills and characteristics um, a, a DVUSD graduate should possess? And then in what ways do, we, do they believe that a DVUSD graduate should contribute to society? And here are just some examples that came from our students and our parents. Here are some more examples. This seemed to be everybody's favorite question. Um, lots of talk on this topic. And then after we put together, um, we went through, as I told you, and analyzed the, the words that we collected from our almost 300 stakeholders, we went together and analyzed them to see which words popped up the most. And from there, we categorized them into categories and then sent them out again to our stakeholders, um, specifically to our parents and our student group for round one and then to everybody for round two. So here's some feedback that we got from one of our parents. For our kids, we took 
the first draft back to them in person and ask them to just give us a score. Uh, out of 10, what score do you think it is? And then give us some written feedback. So we spent about 20 minutes with them during the Superintendent Advisory Council. And um, they, they had great, very specific feedback. They hated the pencil. Um, but beyond, once we got past the fact that they hated the pencil, um, they gave us some really nice feedback on the words. Um, they all found um, the errors that, that were there. Um, and then we went back and revised the, the process again. Here's uh, some of our kids that were working on this feedback. Of course, we took this question, these two questions, to all of our focus groups. In total, we had 20 focus groups, which consisted of all of our stakeholders. Here's a summary again of the different groups that we spoke with. Here are the statistics on the number of participants from our focus groups. And then we looped out the, the different, the plan, as well as the portrait of the graduate. I included at the bottom the dates that I didn't have last time from the governing board update. Uh, um, specifically, speaking of the fall, we've been updating the governing board since pretty much every week, it looks like, since August 5th. And then I just wanted to point out the differences between the um, current strategic plan and the upcoming strategic plan. Um, from the original report, you remember that we did an initial survey and the majority of people and our committee agreed that they wanted to keep the vision, the mission, the core values, the first key strategic priority areas, one, two, and three. We um, did change number four to just be excellence and organizational improvement because the majority of people wanted to embed accountability into each of the, the four areas, which we did. And then for the priority objectives, you can see that we altered them to really match the, the new language or the language that we used currently that aligns to best practices. But if you look at it, you see that it's really not that entirely different. Um, for example, excellence in workforce performance, instead of healthy district culture, we have supportive purposeful workplace culture. Instead of employee sourcing and recruitment, it's employee recruitment and retention. Just a little bit more meaningful to the, the phrases that we use in our professional development and with the resources that we study. So here's the differences here. We did take away um, student enrollment as a priority objective and it became a lag measure instead because we felt like that was more the effect of the work that we were doing. And we heard pretty loud and clear that um, there was a need to, to build and support more business and community partnerships. So that did take the place of that one. And then in, in number four, instead of plan, secure, and allocate district resources, we did change that to optimize resources. It's still essentially the same work. For the portrait of a graduate, um, I pulled up the 2015-16 version and kind of did a little crosswalk so you can see the similarities and the differences between um, the old version and the proposed version. So for, um, you'll see a lot of the same words just in different places. Um, think critically, for example, you find in problem solver, um, employ skills of self-management and leadership, you find in sense of self and others, communicate effectively, there's um, still an entire category on effective communicator. Uh, the next one, demonstrate technical um, knowledge and skills. That came up quite a bit. So you find that in three different areas now. Um, work collaboratively. You see that in problem solver and practice good citizenship. You see that under community contributor. And with that, I will take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Tunis. Ms. Fisher? Um, I wanted to make sure I was not unfair in how I read it. So I posted it. I have both sides of the aisle that follow me. I got two responses from the opposite side of the aisle than myself. And those were, of course, kids need these soft skills. That was one in support of. The other one was, of course, EQ is important. Do better. When I go to the other side, um, and I'm not going to read all of the comments because uh, some of them aren't kind, but one that really uh, reached, hit kind of my point, um, 
and I'm not saying I necessarily agree with the whole thing, but it said, well, it certainly doesn't sound like what they're actually doing. They make flashy graphics all day long, say they want students to be open to multiple perspectives, but in reality, if a student expresses conservative viewpoints, they are shamed, censored, bullied by teachers, and shut down. So many, so maybe they think that sounds uh, good, but it just isn't the normal status quo. Um, and the other, I'm gonna bypass some of those comments. The other comments that I thought were also very meaningful was it's all EQ. What about IQ? That's why they become sensitive snowflakes and, are, and couldn't take the academic challenges. Academic achievements and practical job skills, question mark. Uh, don't schools do that anymore? Um, and that's why I brought that forward, is it's, uh, we add certain words to what was a really, what I thought was a very neutral uh, portrait of a graduate. It was, it, it, it hit all kids. It hit the, the conservative kids, the, the, the not conservative, the religious, the um, LGBT. It, it kind of hit, it encompassed all kids. It didn't have any of those, um, what are trigger words in, in today's society. Um, and now that those are, are in here, um, it, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a viewpoint of a lot of individuals. And, and I believe that taking that direction um, will encourage parents to take their students um, to a more, a school that's more in line with them. Um, and so that is my disappointment. Um, that's why I brought that forward. Um, I'm not the only one reading it the way I did. Um, I understand all the work that you put into it, and I really do appreciate it. Strategic planning is very difficult. I do see where you stayed close to a lot of the um, traditional, you know, academics and, and, and also bringing the kids forward. Um, I just wish it didn't have those um, things that are in society, trigger words. Um, the, the last comment that I received, I didn't receive publicly, I received privately, um, and it was a student. And the student said, we aren't allowed. If we don't, if we don't support um, modern society, we aren't allowed to speak up. Um, and that wasn't the first comment that I, time I'd heard that comment. I heard it way back in, I wanna say like 2017. Um, and so I, I, I would hope that we would have a strategic plan that encompasses all of our children, not just some of our children. That's just my comment. Mrs. Ordway. Oh yeah, um, I was gonna save part of this for my board report, but um, it's that time of year when you start to see students um, that are alumni and they sit and they chat um, and they talk about where they are, what they're doing, and how they got there. So many of the things they'll tell me is, you know, I'm doing great. I learned this at whichever the high school is, and since Deer Valley and O'Connor, and oh, all of you guys are here except for Anita. Anyway, um, they'll just talk about what they learned at, at the schools, and sometimes they go back to the elementary schools. What they are wishing they learned and was maybe specified as a skill are the soft skills. How to be tolerant of many different people, whether they're tall or short, they don't have the same opinions, but to keep an open mind because sometimes um, people that have opposite opinions of you end up filling some voids on, on both sides. And those are from students. Those are from students that have graduated and are either at university, some of them work, uh, I'm trying to see what I have here. Some of them uh, are working in retail and some of them are doing their own thing. But when I have seen them, which is interesting because we just improved 
um, our uh, continuous improving of our strategic plan, it seems to me from the 50 or 60 kids that I've seen so far, and I can send you their phone numbers if you'd like to have some uh, people to talk to, uh, Dr. Tunis, but it seems that the portrait of a graduate seems to be right on tar target. And I would ask Mrs. Fisher which, which word or words she thinks are, are igniting people or, or shocking them. Because I see the word tolerant means I can tolerate left, right, middle, top, bottom, whatever. I see the word financially literate, oh, see on Facebook all the time, wish my kid knew how to do their taxes or balance a, a checking account. I see the word culturally aware, which would be be culturally aware. I mean, that's got nothing that ignites you. So, so I'm looking. I'm looking at the whole thing, and I don't know which words that you're referring to that are um, bothering people and are going to drive them from our district. And Sardway, you already hit those words because teaching children to be tolerant is a good thing, but it comes from their parents. And so, when a student comes to our schools, and they are kind to kids who are who do not share their religious or personal values when they're kind to them, but they don't join in with them. They are somehow um, ostracized. So, we wait. Let me finish ahead. my statement. We have had students who have commented that I almost have to be bisexual because if not, then I'm against LGBTQ, and that's. And, and I'm not comfortable with that. I've had students who have said, um, if I support my heritage, then I'm a racist against other heritages because I, it, because it's not allowed for my race. So while yes, I, I do believe that we need to teach things, what we need to teach is respect. For, for you know, my best friend, and everybody laughs, is a liberal Democrat. We are, I'm a cons very conservative Republican. We don't talk about the subjects that we know that are just trigger points that we just don't, don't um, agree with. We know it's gonna be a controversial conversation. So we just don't do that, we respect each other. And that's what our children need to learn. We should not be teaching our children to be tolerant necessarily of, in other words, we shouldn't teach them they have to accept what is contradictory to their family beliefs as correct. We need to teach them to be respectful that they may not agree with everyone. And those are those trigger words that I took that way and members of the community also took it that way. Well, I guess Mrs. Uh, Dr. Tunis, maybe if you think about adding the word respect, that would solve that problem. Thank you. Mrs. Reed. Um, thank you for asking that question because that's what a question I would ask. Um, and I agree, the parents' role in this is highly critical. And I was speaking to a student the other evening and um, the student was sharing with me their dissatisfaction of their administration and how the administration, had they felt like the administration had failed them at their school because there was bullying that was um, going on that was... Um, not handled swiftly in the student's opinion. And so in talking and asking further questions, um, what it really came down to was the student wasn't upset with administration, the student was upset with those other students' parents because the parents weren't disciplining their, weren't disciplining their kid. Their parents weren't the ones that were telling them, you know what, when you see, when you see somebody, you probably shouldn't say that. You know, it, it would be great if um, parents at some schools, you know, my, my daughter was called a chink almost every single day. And their eyes hurt, they would pull their eyes slanted at her and tell her that she should go back to China where, where she's a quarter Japanese. She's a fifth, fifth generation Japanese American. Those are the types of things being tolerant of people's cultures and differences. Do I want them to be fifth generation Japanese Americans? No, I just want them to be respectful of my daughter and to not call her racial slurs. I mean, I don't think that that's asking too much. 
And from the looks of everybody's face in the audience, I don't think that any of you are saying that that's too much. There's a difference of being tolerant of something and understanding that people have different beliefs and feelings and religions and different viewpoints and lenses all of the time. It doesn't mean that you have to believe those things, but you do need to show them respect that they can believe different things because when it's your turn, you want that same respect shown to you. And I think that's the thing that we're forgetting. My daughter's three quarters white. You know, we, we live in a different society now. We, we don't live in this whitewashed society. We have m multiple cultures and religions and sexual identities and viewpoints and people's political ideologies fall all through this, you know, the spectrum. That's what we saw in the election. We don't have a majority Republican or Democrat in Arizona now. Things are changing and it doesn't mean that if I want to be respectful of somebody that's a member of the LGBTQ community, that doesn't mean that I have to be a member of the LGBTQ community. It means that I need to respect them and I need to show them the respect that I would want to be shown to because I'm a member, because I'm straight. I, I don't understand. That's not a, these are not trigger words, but parents have to, parents have to be a part of this too. And Dr. Tunis, and, and I realize that you did not develop the portrait of a graduate back in 2015, 2016, but was that voted on by that current board when that came on? Um, Ms. Reed, I, I, at the bottom, it says who it was created by. I could not tell you if it was voted on or not. But it, it was, but the board knew about it, correct? Yes. And Mrs. Fisher, didn't you sit on the board when this was done? I, I really don't see much of a difference between the 2015 version and this version today. I think it's it's changed slightly as far as the way that it is um, categorized, but the world has changed quite a bit since 2015. And whether whether we agree with all of the changes or we love all of the changes or we disagree or we want to go back to the way things were, the world's changing and we do need respect, but respect needs to be shown on both sides. I mean, this is, this is trigger words over what this is. And, and I will say that I work for probably, if you asked anybody, my employer would probably be one of the most conservative companies in the United States of America. And I will tell you that as part of my job, um, I have the pleasure of teaching cultural intelligence, which is something that my company came up with and spent probably a lot of money developing. And I teach the majority of our DVUSD students who work in my company cultural intelligence. And one of the cultural intelligence pieces we talk about is how to treat members of the LGBTQ community with respect when they walk into our doors. Do they need to agree with our lifestyle or say, I want to be a part of you know, your club, do I, you know, do I want to be a part of your life? No, but they are our customers and we serve them and we love them when they're in our store. It also talks about serving the homeless with respect, it talks about treating people with disabilities with respect. These are not just, be, we, we focus so much on, on race or sexual identity or religion, but it's a wide variety. Of, of different things that we all just need to realize how to treat each other with respect and how to get along. And I would love that, um, that our schools do these soft skills because talking to other business owners, especially over the last two years, when we're hiring 16 year olds to come in and work, they don't have soft skills. They don't know how to look somebody in the eye and talk to them. They don't know how to go up and start conversations. Yes, yeah, these are things that, um, that their parents should be teaching them. But these are things that we as educators in the educational community should be reinforcing. And these are also things that as community members we should be reinforcing. Because you know what? They go and they interact in the community too. So 
I, I, I don't understand the, the woke part and the trigger words. I don't see any here. I think that this is beautifully done. And I am really proud of the students who um, stepped up and who volunteered their time to help provide feedback. And I'm thankful for all of the parents that provided feedback and the teachers and the staff because it was open to everybody. Nobody was excluded. And so if somebody chose not to speak up, then that's, that's their choice. It has nothing to do with, with, with this. This is the, the, the feedback that you got from the stakeholders who everybody had an opportunity to give feedback to, and it was refined multiple times. So I appreciate your hard work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, um, Dr. Tunis, for providing us some additional information. I would just like to share one conversation that I had regarding the portrait of a DBUSD graduate. And I was asked by um, a community member, didn't I think it was more important to measure and teach and be concerned about the academics that schools are charged with teaching our standards? And why weren't those covered in the portrait of a DBUSD? And my explanation was that we do teach those standards we teach the, the subjects required by the state of Arizona, and we grade our children, our students, in those subjects, and they get report cards, and ultimately, we teach them so that they will graduate from our high schools, ready to go out in the world. That I viewed the portrait of the graduate as the soft skills that have been mentioned several times here this evening. And I'm going to say that um, when I went to school, that was my parents' job. Um, we didn't have the six pair pillars of character or many of the other programs. And not that, that those weren't reinforced in the school, but it certainly wasn't the first place I heard about them. Today, that doesn't happen all the time. And I'm not saying that the schools should be a substitute for parents. But I will tell you that in my role, in my elected position as Phoenix City Councilwoman, I was invited to sit down with some business owners in the city of Phoenix, and they wanted to know how they could work on standards. Actually, they said curriculum, but I told them they would have to start with standards for soft skills, because they want their schools to teach the soft skills, because when their young workers come to them out of high school or community college or college, they're not ready to work in their business. And it's very frustrating. And I'm gonna tell you that the gentleman I met with, one of them, actually I was old enough to be both of their moms, which was a little frustrating, I'm not gonna lie. But it was a really, they wanted to know about the education system. And so what I would say is that, um, thank you for all the work you've done. Thank you for all the people who came and contributed to this. And I would encourage folks to get involved. Um, I know that we are doing better than ever at publicly inviting folks and getting the word. Um, so we do grade our children, our students, on the academics. But we're also making sure that they have the opportunity to learn some other skills. We are not a replacement for parents. We are there to be a partner with the parent. And so with that, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, aye. please say nay. I would like to thank the board for displaying my point to the public. Uh, and I vote nay. I've called, thank you. Mrs. Paperman, you're voting. No, I said I, yeah. Aye. We have four ayes and one nay. Motion passes. Sorry. Consent agenda. Okay. We will be moving on to consent agenda. All right. I would ask that the governing board approve consent agenda items 7A through 7I. I second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Hearing no nays, then motion passes unanimously. We'll be on to action item 
8A. I would ask that the Governing Board approve all the uh, professional development out of state for Governing Board Policy, GCCE. I second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. It's, oh, it's a little delayed. Okay. Ready? 8B. I would ask that the Governing Board accept the administration's recommendation to pre-approve the addenda as presented. I second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Item 8C. On a second or two. All right, I would, oh, Jimmy, you're up. I would ask that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to approve the state farm agreement with SMG for the 2022-23 graduation ceremonies. I second. Mr. Miglarino. Uh, President O'Brien, uh, members of the board, Dr. Finch, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, this is the official contract for um, this year's graduation scheduled for May 17th and May 18th uh, at State Farm Stadium as we've been uh, uh, doing uh, for quite some time now. Uh, the one uh, thing I'd like to point is the uh, State Farm Stadium is requiring us to uh, pay for the expense of metal detectors and for the DPS officers um, at the entrances. Uh, was optional for us uh, for this year is now mandatory so it did increase the price uh, slightly um, and so we're asking the board to approve uh, the contract uh, so that we can solidify this with uh, State Farm Stadium and then just a quick comment that uh, we are in the process in the middle of a solicitation um, uh, Ms. Mock and Ms. Uh, Szymanowski are in the process of, of receiving solicitations for, because this is the fifth and final year of the solicitation that we're using for State Farm Stadium. So um, uh, we will bring that information back to the board at a future, for future graduations. Thank you, Mr. Miglarino. Any questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. I would ask that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to approve the negotiated solution team, otherwise known as NST, revised salary recommendation for 2022-2023. I second. I have a motion and a second. We'll be going to Mr. Miglarino. Uh, any questions? Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> Not going to get off that easy, I don't think. Um, you have famous people here that I think we want to. Uh, President O'Brien, members of the board, Dr. Finch. Uh, this evening we have the uh, salary recommendation revision uh, for your consideration. Uh, we do have a presentation that we're going to share with you. I just wanted to recognize that many of the NST uh, members and negotiation solution team are in the audience. I uh, wanted to recognize uh, their. Uh, efforts to get to this point um, and this is kind of a long uh, process I'll, I'll give you some of the um, dates when the presentation does come up online the uh, um, but we have met uh, about four times there it is four times since um, the end of last school year so last school year we developed uh, the the recommendation We've met four times, um, actually a fifth time if you count this evening, uh, to develop this this uh, revision to the salary recommendation. Um, so back in March, we uh, approved the benefit recommendation. Uh, April 12th, we actually approved, the, uh, the board approved the salary recommendation as it stands. Uh, what we're asking the board to do now is revise um, the salary recommendation, uh, specifically because uh, we know that there's uh, the likelihood that the aggregate expenditure limit uh, is going to be resolved. I know that we're being optimistic here, but um, uh, we had a what we refer to as trigger language in the agreement uh, if the aggregate expenditure limit was resolved. Um, we maintained the trigger language. Uh, again, it's contingent on the AEL being resolved, 
uh, but we revised how the uh, amount would be uh, would be paid out. And essentially, the NST group looked at various options. We started by just collecting information about um, needs that we have as an organization, looked at uh, open vacancies, um, some comparative data on uh, salary amounts, starting and uh, hiring amounts. And we actually started to get very detailed in um, developing a recommendation that would be uh, specific. For example, addressing just one group or one um, area of need. Uh, what we later found that the list got so long is that we just need to increase the amount, kind of the rising tide uh, lifting all ships uh, concept. <clears throat> and that's what this recommendation uh, essentially does. Uh, this is the previously approved salary recommendation, the area that uh, we are uh, considering to change. So uh, previously approved, if the aggregate expenditure limit is approved, um, there would be an additional 1.5% salary increase for our uh, staff. I'm showing all of these slides, but there's really not a, a reason to be able to go through this in, uh, by reading each slide. The bold uh, says the same thing for each employee group, certified, other professional, uh, classified staff, and then finally, admin exempt. <coughs> What the, uh, the component that the negotiation solution team looked at is that in order for us to have a meaningful salary increase to recognize our employees for the efforts that they contribute on a daily basis and to be able to help uh, fill the vacancies that we have uh, throughout the district, uh, and that's inclusive of all employee groups, that we needed to take the $13 million of new state funding that uh, we have identified with the board, we have not allocated. <clears throat> Again, we held those monies aside, and, um, not knowing exactly if the aggregate expenditure limit would be resolved. Uh, we wanted to take additional carry forward to increase that amount. Uh, Ms. Mock reported in the annual financial report in October. Uh, we have additional carry forward. Tonight's board, uh, excuse me, budget revisions will add to that amount, as she indicated in the, in the public hearing. And then finally, we do have some federal stimulus funding um, that is a consideration. So in the result, uh, in, in the unlikely scenario that the AEL does not get resolved, um, you've heard us talk before, it is $46.7 million uh, for the district. And we would use the unallocated funding, the $13 million we just mentioned. Uh, we have additional ESSER funds or the federal stimulus money. Uh, we have about $25 million worth of care. And unfortunately, we will not be able to avoid some form of budget reductions because, again, that aggregate expenditure limit uh, would have to be imposed in this school year. Um, and it could be imposed as late as um, March 1st. We will be significantly through the school year. Uh, and because 86% of our budget is in salaries and benefits, we, we would have paid a good deal of our budget already uh, just to the labor costs uh, for the district. But we do have a plan, so if the AEL does not get resolved, uh, we can cover this year. Um, next year is something that we don't have a plan for at this point in time, to be quite frank with you. Um, we hope that it gets resolved this year. Like we said, we anticipate that it will. And in the event that it does, what the NST was able to come up with was what I'm going to classify as significant salary increases for our staff based on input that not only the NST has looked at, but what the governing board has shared with us through the process of developing this salary recommendation all of last year as well. Um, so here's what the cost breakdown looks like. Um, and not to get too deep into the weeds uh, in, in regards to all these numbers, essentially we wanted to make sure that there was uh, some form of uh, uh, amount per employee group that was uh, uh, similar uh, for each of the three major employee groups. So uh, again, with a flat dollar increase, um, the amounts are on the far right side. So $7,500 per FTE for our admin exempt group is about a 9% increase. Uh, $5,500 per our certified and other professional staff, uh, that's a 10% increase. And $1.40 per hour for our classified staff would be also uh, right at about a 9% uh, increase. 
That spends uh, just about $21 million, so that's $8 million of carry forward combined with the $13 million of new state funding. And just as a reminder, uh, that new state funding is continuing uh, a continuing revenue source for us um, <clears throat> as well. So what does the salary recommendation revision look like? So this slide did not change, so uh, we did not alter anything uh, related to professional growth. Um, but here's where the changes occur. Uh, so with the bullet for the AEL, instead of it stating that there would be a 1.5% increase if the AEL res is resolved, we've inserted the flat dollar increases. And with the intentions of paying it out this year, because remember these monies were something that we were promised this year, we just don't, we have the authority to spend them until the aggregate expenditure limit gets resolved. Uh, but we would pay it out this year in a one-time payment after the AEL is resolved and then add it to uh, future employment agreements um, for employees. So just for example, if a teacher made um, you know, $55,000 uh, this year, we would pay them the $5,500 um, in one-time payment this year, but we would also start their uh, salary amount at $60,500 for FY24. <clears throat> There are uh, some additional dates in here that, that are important just to make sure that uh, people can uh, expect when the, when the amount's going to be paid. We do have to give some grace to our payroll and benefit staff because the month of January is a very uh, hectic time, um, closing out the calendar year, uh, tax implications, uh, W-2s, uh, et cetera. So uh, there's just some timing clarification that this would not happen before February 1st. Uh, but we would, we did want to make sure that people knew that we were committed to doing this as as quickly as possible. Um, two other notes uh, while I'm on this slide, uh, actually three. Now that I think of it, um, the uh, the amount would be added to the hiring schedule. So this would take our beginning teacher salary to fifty thousand dollars for this year, um, and then for uh, for uh, fiscal year twenty four, that would be yet to be determined. Um, we think that's a big milestone. Uh, it also changes the index for our addenda. Our certified manual reads that the addenda are a percentage of an indexed value that does not exist. We don't calculate, we have to calculate it each year. It changes that to be the, st the starting rate as the index. That'll just be, it'll help clarify that for, uh, for folks going forward because it's a published number. And then we've taken out, uh, you know, the payment uh, they see the the last bullet that's str uh, struck here. We've taken out that uh, payment because it's uh, we did not want it to be confusing or conflicting with the um, AEL payment that uh, uh, we created language for for above. So this is the certified teacher increase. It has a little bit more uh, involved uh, language in it because of the addenda and whatnot. The uh, other professional staff, same same language, replacing 1.5 with $5,500 per FTE, and then striking the uh, language that so there's not a conflict. Uh, the classified staff, this replaces the 1.5 percent with a dollar 40 per hour, and again that dollar 40 is added to the hiring schedule for all ranges. Um, we think that will be significant in helping us fill vacancies, and we the one-time payment uh, it is how it will be calculated here. So we'll take the position that they're in, the number of days that they're scheduled to work, we'll multiply it by the hours that they work in their employment agreement, times the $1.40 and pay it out as a one-time payment. And again, that $1.40 will be added to their fiscal year 24 employment agreement uh, and future years as well. And then again, just striking the conflicting uh, um, language in the final bullet that, um, within the classified group. And then again, the same thing with the uh, admin exempt group. Uh, it's $7,500 per FTE um, with um, the, uh, uh, th that same amount being added to the various hiring schedules. Uh, so this is a, a very significant. The flat increase, we uh, heard from several of the board members that this was a preferred method. We did look at this as a way to also um, make sure that the uh, hiring schedule were adjusted by those amounts to be able to help 
recruit, but more importantly, to make sure that we were valuing our employees uh, and recognizing everybody with, with an increase for um, the, the work that they do in the district. Uh, this is just a graph that shows what the history has been for the past six years in terms of salary increases. You'll notice that, uh, so the admin exempt group I think is on the left, the middle group happens to be the classified <coughs> uh, group, uh, far right is the certified group, um, and the cumulative amount is the far right column in each of those graphs. Uh, this is what, uh, how it's, the, the upper left hand uh, graph is how it stands prior to this particular revision that we're suggesting, the lower right hand uh, graph actually would be uh, with this increase in place. So you can kind of see the certified uh, increase does include the 20 by 2020 initiative that Governor um, sponsored. So th that is one of the reasons why that amount is uh, increased as well as classified, or excuse me, classified uh, classroom site fund increases. Um, that are uh, specific to uh, instruction and instructional support uh, personnel only. So it just gives you a sense of what the increases have been uh, over the, the last six years in each of those graphs. <clears throat> uh, so next steps, um, uh, if the, and this is an action item that we're asking the board to consider this evening. Um, it still would be contingent on the, a the AEL being resolved. That is something that we have to count on the legislature to approve. Uh, a special session has to be called. Uh, it's been widely advertised uh, and covered in the media, so I won't go into a great deal about that. Um, the hiring schedules would need to get updated. As I mentioned, we want to add these flat dollar amounts to the hiring schedules <clears throat> to help uh, also from a, the recruitment standpoint. We'll have to make some edits to the certified manual again for that addenda index that I mentioned previously. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll have to make sure that uh, we add the amounts to everybody's uh, you know, contract base for, uh, for next year. The one thing that we are uh, mentioning, and the NST has, um, has certainly been advised of this as well, uh, this salary increase does, uh, it is likely that the amount of available resources for the fiscal year 24 increases uh, will be something short of the, the graphs that you see on this chart. Uh, but that is a conscious decision that uh, the NST uh, is, is willing to make. So um, we are not saying that there won't be salary increases for, uh, for, uh, for next year. What we're saying is there probably won't be on the magnitude that we've seen uh, of, of, of these increases. Um, and I am pleased to say that we did get unanimous support for the for this revision and be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And again, there are some NST members in the audience if you would want to defer questions to them as well. Thank you, Mr. McLarino. I'm just going to say my ego is a little shattered now. I thought you all were here to see us off, but now I know it's really about the money. <laughs> no, seriously, thank you all who um, participate on the committee for your hard work and for those of you who've come out tonight to, to support um, this action item, I really appreciate it. I know your days are long, um, so this, uh, uh, you really, it's great that you're out here this evening. Any questions, board members? Mrs. Paperman. Uh, so, so the 1.5% is just a one-time pay, not part of the base, and it's a separate from the 13 million not allocated. Uh, President O'Brien, Ms. Paperman, the um, the one point five percent would be uh, overwritten by the flat dollar amount increase that we're proposing. Um, so, in place of the one point five percent, we would provide a, a flat dollar amount increase as a substitute to that. Okay, and this is what the team agreed to. Correct. Okay. A, unanimous, a unanimous support, if I heard you correctly. That is correct. And another question. Uh, so classified, they give a dollar forty an hour. Uh, why do we have the administration? Uh, they're getting more than classified. So, so is it necessary to include administration into the salary increase? for this school year and give more to the classifieds and teachers? Uh, President O'Brien, uh, Ms. Paperman, that's an excellent question. Uh, so on a percentage basis, they're very similar. I think they're within a tenth of each other of, of a percent. So they're, I, I've rounded them there. I think they're both showing us 9% on this chart.
Um, and we felt it was necessary for the admin exempt to be included because uh, this is a, a broad category of, of individuals in this uh, admin exempt. It includes not only our high school principals, but deans, but it also includes our lowest level supervisors. Um, and so uh, the, what the average increase would be 9%, but for our highest paid um, administrators, it's going to be far less than that because it's a flat dollar amount. Um, we felt that this was necessary because the increases, the committee looked at this uh, in detail, but the increases for the admin group have been less than the other groups over the past six years. And we're dealing with some compression issues with uh, teaching staff and trying to recruit from a, within our teaching staff for some administrative positions um, because it, it's actually um, not monetarily advantageous to them to, to uh, move into uh, some of these administrative positions because the salary increases have been so much more for the teachers over these past six years I'm talking about specifically. So we did not want to exclude them and we wanted them to have uh, a percentage that was on par with uh, at least the classified group at the same percentage. Well, I had uh, many community members, especially with the classified concerns, you know, maintaining the school, cleaning the school. I think uh, in the economy, the way we are sometimes, we need to make sacrifices. And I'm sure the administrators will be willing, uh, even if it's one year that they did not get any increases, to give it more to their classifieds or so they can have more staff on campus. Thank you. Mr. Yeah. McGuirino, sorry, you were going to say something. Uh, uh, just r real quickly, uh, President O'Brien, Ms. Paperman, I, I should note that initially, uh, to your point, um, the uh, admin exempt percentage, the, the way that we distribute salary increases, or we have historically, I should say, in Deer Valley, is we look at the total amount of salary dollars and we divide that over the percentage of of the amount for each employee group. So we would look at, that's why you see the percent of the total here in the center columns. So if any, if there are any new dollars, then 7% of those new dollars would go to the admin exempt group, um, like on this chart. Um, that actually calculated out to be about $8,500 uh, per admin exempt group. And so they did make a concession to reduce that down to $7,500 to be able to add more to the classified group. So that was part of the discussion that, and, and, and is part of the recommendation. Um, Mr. Maglarino, you talked about some um, job classifications in the uh, supervisor uh, positions. Could you identify a couple of those supervisor positions that would fall within the admin and exempt category, please? Uh, certainly, uh, President O'Brien. So we have, uh, for example, we have two supervisors within our technology de department that oversee all help desk um, uh, personnel, our, what we refer to as our CNTs. Um, we have our lead supervisors within transportation, um, and I'm sure I'm going to miss a lot of no, others. I, I but just needed a couple of examples. So we're, as you said, weren't just talking about... Um, high school administrator or high school administrators or school administrators. It's a broad um, category of jobs um, in a supervisory capacity. So um, I also did want to say um, thank you to the groups for listening to your governing board members. We really appreciate that you did this. I think this is a, a very good thing for um, uh, all of our staff and I would call on our governor and our legislature to deliver on their promise and fix the AEO problem, go into special session immediately and make this a much merrier Christmas and a happier holiday and a great new year for all the teachers in Arizona. It is a travesty that that has not been fixed. And with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Please say aye. 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 Oh, Mrs. Fisher. Jim, uh, I, I do want to thank you guys, and, and I do understand administration has to also be included. Um, when you're in a situation where your employee has jumped over you, it makes it really difficult to come to work every day, you know, when you come to that realization. Um, 
Was there any consideration for actually reviewing some of our classified staff who are at the lowest level? And I, and I understand that the flat rate is going to help the lowest level as, as, a lot as well. But when we have some of the positions that are cross-category into other industries, um, we're going to lose them because we, we're just not even in the ballpark of what other industries are paying them. Was there any consideration in that at all? Uh, President O'Brien, uh, Ms. Fisher, uh, yes, we uh, we did look to um, because some of the requests, as I as I stated, we, we looked at a lot of information. The NST looked at a lot of information, and initially they started looking at um, you know just which jobs do we have the most vacancies in, uh, and specifically like targeting areas. And what we realized is that as we um, made an attempt to say, hey, maybe we want to make some specific targeted uh, increases for maybe a group or a, a, a certain classification of employees. Um, the reality is then they started to, it, the, the, what we learned is there, there wasn't a relativity problem within our district in terms of the ranges or how positions uh, were ranked, if you will, from a responsibility standpoint. It's just that there wasn't enough money to fund any of them at an appropriate level. Um, so there's there's probably room for us to do a more formal analysis, but we actually were looking at um, neighboring districts, uh, their, their beginning hiring ranges, those uh, wages, those are the easiest uh, to access because you can get them from the internet. Uh, you know, most, most of the websites have those posted. And so looking at that, um, this would take our lowest uh, starting wage to 1525, if I'm doing the math correct, right? 1385 is minimum wage. Um, and then a uh, dollar forty on top of that, but that should be fifteen twenty-five. So um, that's significant. Right now, that a dollar amount is thirteen dollars and seventy cents. Uh, so it was a significant increase um, to the, the the lowest wages as a flat dollar amount would be. Um, and so it it is going to help the bottom more than the top. Um, that's inherent in a flat increase like this, but it does. Uh, we do believe it'll help us from a recruitment standpoint, but a formal analysis that that was not done as part of this. I just I just want to keep it on the record that I believe we need to do it. Um, when we have paras, I know teachers are valuable, but you find me a special education teacher who can do their job without para support, and I, I think you'll have a lot of unhappy teachers. Um, and so I th and same thing, we, we, we heard what happened when we didn't have custodial staff. So um, I just want to keep it on the record that we need to seriously look at some of these classified positions because when they can um, take a job with less stress and responsibility of, say, a para who has to not only have all of the Title IX certifications and keep their first aid CPR and oftentimes serve as a teacher um, with the guidance of a teacher and we're paying them, you know, at a low rate, um, we're losing them. You know, the, the staff that comes and works with my son, their day job is, is our paras in, the, in other school districts. Um, and my, my son's para's husband just left being a para to work for a private agency full time because he, he couldn't afford that salary. Um, of course, I told Stephen that if he leaves me, um, there'll be words because my son really loves him. But we can't um, uh, we can't mitigate some of these class of, we can't continue to mitigate some of these classified. And anytime you're looking at a salary um, range like this, there's concern. So I just want to keep that on the record. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Hearing none, the vote passes unanimously. Congratulations. Did you, did I get that wrong? No, that's fine. I just was making sure I didn't get that one wrong. All right, All right, so we are moving to, uh, would ask that the governor, oh, you're all leaving now, huh? Cool. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, before. Fair weathered friends, I see. <laughs> you, can't, you can't leave until we pass the next one. 
Let the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to adopt the fiscal year 2022 expenditure budget revision number 50. Did I do that? Oh, that's because they were all leading. Um, I would ask that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to approve the revised fiscal year 23 classified hiring schedule. I second. Mr. Meglarino. Uh, President O'Brien, uh, members of the board, Dr. Finch, I'll just be brief. Uh, brief? It's, it says that this is the administration's recommendation, but it's actually required by law um, that we um, increase this. Uh, what we did, what we are recommending is that we're just going to increase the uh, the amount for range 14 and 15, our lowest two ranges, so they'll, they'll both be at $13.85. And this is something that the negotiation solution team will look at at, at, at any adjustments to those beginning rates uh, as we develop the fiscal year 24 salary recommendation for next year, so whether or not uh, you know we want to create a differentiation between those two ranges. Uh, but for now, this would just get us compliant with the new minimum wage starting January 1st at 1385 an hour. We certainly want to be compliant with the law. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. seems to be passing unanimously. All right, so now I'll ask that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to adopt the fiscal year 2021-2022 expenditure budget revision. Number three. Excellent. Mrs. We have a motion and a second, and Mrs. Mock covered this in our public hearing. I'm a, a guessing that nothing changed in the last um, hour and 50 minutes. President O'Brien, you are correct. There have been no changes since the public hearing. Awesome. You didn't get a text from the legislature saying they're doing some kind of a special budget? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. G? Okay. I would ask that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to adopt fiscal year 2022-23 expenditure budget revision number one. I second. We have a motion and a second, and I'm going to go with no change since 7 o'clock. All right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. In that case, I would ask that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to approve revised tax credit and fee authorization for 2022-2023. I second. And we have a motion and a second. Mrs. Mock. President O'Brien, members of the board, guests with us still in person and online. Um, President O'Brien, I thought perhaps all those folks were here for the budget revision, so I share um, your disappointment that um, (laughs) they did not stay, but thank you to those who did. Um, Oh, they stayed for Dr. Z. I'm so sorry. Um, hmm, We'll see about that. Um, This item, we do want to be quick. It is uh, getting close to 9 o'clock, and I know we all have... um, families and lives outside of this meeting to go to, but this is an important item for us. Previously, we had students who were homeschooled and enrolled in our schools for a part-time, full-time equivalency or FTE for which we were um, submitting average daily membership to the state, and so we were being funded for their partial attendance, specifically um, in our elective programs, mostly banned, And um, with the expansion of the ESAs or the empowerment scholarship accounts this year, these homeschool students uh, have, some of our homeschool students have applied for and received the empowerment scholarship account from the state of Arizona. So now they are receiving funding directly from the state and we are legally not permitted to submit them for average daily membership or they actually could risk losing their scholarship. So what we um, have elected to do is to propose these fees for you this evening for those students to be able to continue to uh, participate in classes such as the Mountain Ridge uh, State Championship Band Program. Um, And we came to these amounts by looking at the base support level for each student, adding the weights for K-8, K-6, and high school, and uh, adding our M&O override percentage as well as our district additional assistance, and then um, equating that to what a course would be. And so we are presenting uh, a fee of $1,200 per course per year for an elective course for K-6 students, 
Um, most 7-8 electives are year long, but in the if there are any uh, semester courses, we did break that down into $600 per course per semester. And then for high school, it would be $800 per course per semester for elective classes in our brick and mortar schools. And with that, I will take any questions. Mrs. Reed. Just to clarify, um, if a student is homeschooled and not receiving ESA funds, they can still be a part of band or choir or whatever program they are involved in and not be charged these fees, correct? Mrs. Reed, that is correct. Ms. Fisher? So the fees, are, do, are we allowed to submit ADM for those students? President O'Brien, Mrs. Fisher, yes, we are. And currently, um, previously, I should say, as long as they are not on an ESA, we can submit for ADM. Um, and so we'll just use the example of high school band. If we have a student who is participating in um, one course of high school band, we sit, submit them for ADM the way we would as a tuition payer one and a .25 FTE for the time that they are in that class. But they're not paying tuition. Correct. Correct. We are receiving ADM opposed to the tuition. So this just shifts since they're receiving the funding directly, um, submitting the, having them pay for the tuition instead of uh, us free. Okay. So if a student, ESA or not, applies to, to attend a class at Aspire, it's 179 for an online class. Or 75, sorry. I don't have my glasses. Oh. I had to squint a little bit. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Fisher, that is correct. Um, however, um, that is correct. That is the current rate per semester per course is $175 or up to $350. But that is for um, credit advancement or um, credit recovery, typically. Any of our students that we can submit for uh, ADM, we are submitting, and of course, they attend at zero cost. Um, we do not have any, to my knowledge, we do not have any of our um, students in a homeschool program who've asked to enroll or pay tuition for any of those classes. Okay. Because my concern is, um, and I get to some extent is to penalize people for having ESAs, but they only receive 80% of what the public school district receives, or 90%, 90% um, but we're charging them 100% of what we would receive if they were attending our district, correct? Uh, President O'Brien, Mrs. Fisher, it is an estimate um, based on the base support level plus some of the weighted counts that we would receive. Um, and I can't remember, I would have to look at all of the weights that we have, um, but most specifically, it's just those top three weights are override, the district additional assistance amount or the capital, and then the um, weight for the grade, the, the group A weight for the grade level as well. Okay, are we taking into account any of you know, what other um, ways that those students would be weighted? Or is it strictly those weights? Mrs. Fisher, it's just strictly those three weights based on um, for the students. We do not take into account if they would be a, a group B or other weight because we would not necessarily be servicing them for right. those um, I just those wanted needs. to make sure that our special needs kids aren't being penalized, uh, you know, for because they do get a significantly larger amount. Um, I just want to make sure that they weren't being additionally penalized for being on an ESA. Mrs. Fisher, that is an excellent point. And I have clarified that with exceptional student services at ADE, we had a very specific conversation about that. And Deer Valley Unified School District is a district that um, is lucky enough to receive Title VI B funding for IDEA or individuals with uh, uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Mm -hmm. And so prior to ESAs and even as ESAs continue, because it is a federal fund, we are required to use um, 
what is called proportionate share of that fund for our private school students and our homeschool students. And so Dr. McCusker and her team are required to reach out. Um, for example, we have, uh, they're required to reach out and see if we can find those students and determine if there's any related services that we can provide to them using that IDEA funding. So um, when it comes to the related services and our um, special education population that are not enrolled in our school, we actually continue to provide those services for free and any tuition we charge is truly just going to be for um, an elective course at a brick and mortar school. So if one of these students who, who's paying the tuition, the amounts you have here, uh, is say in need of a paraprofessional or a support of that nature, would that then be covered through, through this? Um, or would the parent be allowed to provide that, you know, be with them and provide that, or how would that work? Mrs. Fisher, we've not come across that yet, but um, that is something that the Special uh, Student Support Services Department would work in the related services plan and determine if that was something that was needed and it um, potentially could be part of the, um, I think I'm getting an incoming message from Dr. McCusker as well, but, um, sorry. Um, She's me. She's about sorry, to I just wanna make sure I'm saying the right information. <laughs> it works too. Um, like that's, that's what technology does for us these days. Um, but it would be their team. So they would take a look at the student and the disability and the need. I'm not trying to put you on the no, spot. It's fine. I'm really just trying to make sure our special well, needs students are. Well, they I, could I, also I, enroll at any yeah. time and, and That's case true. solved. But, but, but I had the same. a lot of yeah. other services. And we it's had, for only um, for uh, elective classes as well. Correct. Which is a variable. Correct. And we had the same concerns. Most, uh, we, a lot of our discussion um, revolved around making sure that the tuition that we charged was fair and equitable and that we were not inadvertently um, charging an otherwise potentially protected class more than we would charge any other student. Right. So that, that was, was part my, of the discussion. That's my concern. That's my concern. All right. Thank you for, uh, I'm sure there'll be other questions. I'll, I'll email them. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Okay. Here we go. Preview item. We got through all the action items, right? Yes, we did. Ms. Sheila, thank you. I'm always trying to jump ahead. Preview item, governing board policy KB, parental involvement in education, and for that we're going to Dr. Galligan. President O'Brien, members of the board, Dr. Fink, and guests. Policy KB, parental involvement in education, had changes um, from House Bill 2161 and 2439. Um, it is amended in the, the following way as listed up there, that school districts will create procedures enabling parents to request access to school district and employ electronic records that relate specifically to their child. You've seen something like this come through with policy IJL and IJNC, where parents can access the books their children have read, that historical list, as well as see the books that are available at their campus. So that is what this policy is. It's updating KB based on House Bill 2161 and 2439. Okay, this is a preview item. So board members have questions or comments? I have one. Board, you have one. Mrs. Ordway? We already have procedures for this um, policy, correct? President O'Brien, Ms. O Ordway, we do have many procedures and, and policy IJL and IJNC for the library materials. That is new, and you will see a new AMG coming forward based on changes to those policies, and that will be true for anything else that might need to be created. Thank you. Ms. Fisher? I would ask that this not be put in consent agenda for the January meeting to allow the two newly elected board members an opportunity to comment, uh, if they have comments, and be able to not have it just forced into our consent agenda. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. It's been so noted and will be, be included as an action item on the January agenda. All right, we'll move to governing board reports. Mrs. Fisher. I'm gonna keep it brief because uh, I 
received a message that I have to go. Um, I first I want I do want to wish everybody a uh, merry, very merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, happy New Year, uh, Kwanzaa, whatever. I don't know all the holidays that are between here and the next board meeting. I'm sure there are many, many. Um, but whatever you celebrate, celebrate it happy. Celebrate it with your family. Um, and if you're lucky enough to have a dog, celebrate it with your dog because uh, no matter what, you come home to love when you have a dog. Um, I want to go ahead and answer, uh, and one we already hit when we talked about the eligibility, um, but because the question was asked to me specifically um, and was put in a Friday update, I wanted to make sure that um, it is publicly answered here that uh, ESA students can uh, pay for coursework such as the extracurriculars. Um, I do want to be very clear because there is a lot of times people are saying, oh, well, these ESA kids get $40,000, $30,000, and that is not true. Some students do, uh, especially if they are, say, autistic or uh, medically fragile in some way. They will get weighted very heavily and, and potentially could be up to $30,000. Um, uh, and so those, those funds are to ensure that those students have the various therapies they need, the supports that they need, um, and they're the same funds that would also come to the district. Um, the standard student would get around $7,000 ballpark, um, which is 90% of what we have. Um, so for the parents that did submit that question, there's your answer. Um, the other question that was asked um, and was answered in the Friday update was also about um, athletics and sports, was for students who are receiving a D or a high D. Um, and uh, the, the answer is that yes, they potentially could still play uh, the schools that have the uh, new grading system. It's just, there was a miscommunication. So if you are a parent of a student who is in that situation, talk to your administration at that district or at that school um, and then if it doesn't go through, go ahead and escalate it that way um, as well. The, uh, the other thing I wanted to be sure to note um, is, you know, we, I brought forward concerns about one of our school's administration. Uh, I know other board members. I, I did it publicly in a board meeting because that's my avenue. Um, allowed avenue, uh, and I know other board members had brought back, brought forward that same school. And those, uh, I don't want those teachers who brought those issues forward to believe at any point that I think they're lying or are making it up uh, because there was discussion on my um, page that they were made up. Um, and so um, I, I would still like some of those uh, addressed the Friday update uh, kind of gave them a pass that it was basically you know it's a okay um, but some of those teachers are still saying it's not they're not a, they're, they are not a okay and what's happening at their school is not a okay um, and I'm not going to call out names because it's, it's Christmas time and the individuals who would address it they know they know the, the school um, but I think our our teachers need to be Teach, not just teachers, all of our employees, they need to be able to let us know when there is an issue without expecting that they're going to be berated for bringing forward an issue. Um, and so uh, I really hope that kind of changes in the new year, that we bring a little bit more of that open um, communication for our staff members. Um, I'm sure I have a note somewhere else, but this is my second board meeting of the day, and I'm really tired and have family responsibility, so I'm going to have to go. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you in January. I hope you get whatever it is you um, want in the holiday season. Um, but most importantly, uh, enjoy your families. Enjoy your rest um, and enjoy um, the good parts of life. Because the parts that suck, they'll still be there. 
um, but the good parts are what we need to embrace. So Merry Christmas to y'all, and um, I will take my leave. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Paperman. Mine is short and sweet. I would like to let everyone know, staff, community, community members, parents, happy holiday, enjoy it with your family. Uh, this is my first year where I'm going to experience the transition of new board members and uh, board members leaving. And uh, respectfully, I would like to say thank you for your services and, and looking forward to work uh, with the next uh, team that will be coming in in January. Thank you, Mrs. Paperman. Mrs. Ordway. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's going to be a little bit long. Hmm. Uh, first of all, I would like to have everyone keep uh, Terry Vaughn's family in mind. Um, O'Connor and Las Brisas uh, need a little extra love this week and the following weeks. Uh, let's see. We've had fine arts and athletics, academics, um, DECA. Every, everybody's moving and grooving. And I have heard that Avenue 27 is again um, making your your tummies very very full and satisfied. So in the January, you know, go see and eat there. Um, I would like to say that uh, Deer Valley Education Foundation, um, your staff, your outreach, along with uh, Julie Ann. Um, I almost sounded like Julian. Anyway, um, we have been so fortunate to feed and uh, buy necessities and wants for, I think we're over now, if you uh, count Thanksgiving, we're over three, 400 families. Um, and we're um, still, uh, this week I'll be um, 10 more cards for 10 more schools, so that's, that's a good thing. And Maria, I really thank you for sharing the generosity of Albertson and Safeway with us. Um, a long time ago in a faraway land, and that would have been eight years ago, uh, Mrs. O'Brien started her service on the board. Prior to that, we were on some really fun uh, committees, weren't they? Yes. Um, anyway, so we had a couple of years, and then she's two years into her service, and there's a lot of stuff going around, not, not a lot of, um, maybe it was a lot of fake news, so we decided that we were going to always use the four-letter F word, fact, F-A-C-T, always use fact, base all of, um, any decision that we made would be determined by fact. So we thought that we would change that connotation there of that four-letter F word, and I think we, we might have gotten through it. So I want to describe Julie and uh, Anne as always students first. <clears throat> Compassion, passion, strategy. Looking at the big picture always while remembering that there are individuals that we are making decisions for. Oh, let's see. Sustainability, longevity. Generous, beyond belief of heart and time which is going to be your legacy. So with that, I think it's Julie's turn. Oh, you one more thing. Oh. I didn't, and I didn't, it, this is written. I am looking forward to continuing the great work of DVUSD with our new board in January. Thank you, Mrs. Ardway, for those very kind words. Mrs. Reed. Thank you, Mrs. Paperman so, and uh, Mrs. for the kind words. I really appreciate it. Um, Last week, it was a really neat opportunity that we had to come together as a community um, to welcome TSMC families um, at O'Connor and the O'Connor region. And um, it was just, it was magical um, seeing all of these kids. And um, I had team members that were there. I was there in a business capacity as a community partner uh, for the district. And um, I had team members that came with me, and um, one of them pulled me aside afterwards and said the most profound thing. Um, we didn't, you know, we didn't all speak the same language, but we all knew how to smile and how to give high fives, and we all knew how to have fun and dance. And it was the neatest thing. Um, our Chick-fil-A cow led and taught all of the kids how to do the chicken dance. Um, 
and everybody had a great time and parents and grandparents were out there dancing and it was just an amazing event. So kudos to um, Sandra Day O'Connor and the staff and administrators who um, put that event together and a huge thank you to all of our business partners that were there. There were 10 different restaurants that were there that provided food and activities for um, our new um community members and students. And I, I just couldn't think of a better way to welcome them and um, teach them a little bit about um, our community. So it was a it was really neat. Um, I also had the opportunity to um, go into a classroom and do some judging for Educators Rising, which was really cool. Um, and just to see the projects and where they were, I think I sat next to Dr. Finch and we think we may have a winner in, in one of the, the um, projects that we judged. And so that was a really neat opportunity. That was really um, my last official classroom visit and act as a governing board member. And it was, um, I got a little teary when I was walking out of Deer Valley High School and out of the, the hallway for the last time, and looking at all the pictures um, that lined the, the hallway in the admin building, um, knowing that next time I, I'm gonna be there, I won't be a board member. Um, but it was a neat opportunity. Um, and then uh, this last week, we also um, put together our community angel tree and um, seeing the community come together once again, um, we sponsored over 50 DVUSD families. Um, some of them had eight kids, some of them had six kids, some of them just had one. Um, but Everything that the kids asked for, um, they received, and the outpouring of generosity from our community and community business partners, again, was just awe-inspiring. And um, I'm so thankful for the partnership that we have with Deer Valley Education Foundation and their board and Marie for um, seeing that this um, program is important and helping us solidify the legacy of um, this North Phoenix community angel tree so that we'll continue to live on and we'll still be able to provide Christmas for families um, for years to come because we know that there's always going to be need a need and we know that there will always be people who will step up. So thank you so much, Marie, and thank you to the DVEF board for everything that you've done to um, be there for us and for your staff. It, their help has been tremendous. Um, so I just wanted to kind of recap, um, since it, this is my last board report, and I'm going to try and keep it as short as possible. Um, so I'm going to move quick. Um, uh, I came on in 2019, and 2019 was an amazing year. It was great. I got to go to schools, and I got to be involved in activities and go to games and musicals and shows and all of these things, and it was fantastic. And uh, I think I took it for granted, um, you know, to be honest, like that, that's just what you do. You, you get to do these things and then 2020 happened and, and COVID um, shut everything down. And we dealt with three years of COVID and um, that really took my, uh, my board service in a direction that I didn't think that I was going to take. And uh, I've had so many people that have asked, you know, would you have run for the governing board if you would have known that you would have had to deal with COVID? And I said, you know, absolutely not. Like this was not, <laughs> this was not, um, this was not an, a pleasant surprise um, to have a global pandemic um, descend upon you and you get to be the one who makes the decisions. Um, but we had some really great things that happened in those crazy COVID years. And I just wanna talk about some of the ones that I'm the most proud of, our district for. Um, we opened Union Park. We opened Inspiration Mountain. We opened the Aspire Campus. We repurposed Bel Air into Bel Air Traditional School. Um, we expanded the online program and were certified that way. And not only that, but we are the top online school in the state of Arizona, which is amazing. Um, this board um, saw to the continued growth of the Mandarin Immersion Program, which back when that was being called into question and we had a board member that wanted to get rid of it, we didn't know TSMC was gonna come down the pipeline in a couple of years. And that Mandarin Immersion Program was one of the key reasons why they came here. And so I am so thankful that we had administrators and um, staff that saw the value in that and that fought hard to keep that Mandarin Immersion Program and um, who, um, also taught me a lot about, um, about the immersion program and, and what that looked like. And then we brought another immersion program to Union Park. 
um, we passed a foreign trade zone to allow TSMC um, to be built here, which was amazing. Um, if our board hadn't passed that foreign trade zone, TSMC wouldn't be there because all taxing jurisdictions have to pass a foreign trade zone. Does um, we passed a bond and an override. So we got to take care of our buildings and our staff and raise salaries and build new schools and buy new technology. And I'm so thankful um, for our community for passing that bond and that override. Um, and we helped ensure that everyone got raises every year, even in the midst of COVID and even in the midst when we didn't know if you know, we were going to lose teachers or what was going to happen. Um, we, we still made sure that um, everybody got paid um, and we didn't lose anybody. We didn't have to cut any positions. And, and those were amazing things. And I'm so thankful that um, our finance department had the foresight um, to be able to put money away and um, to save for those rainy days when we, when we were going to have them. Um, and then one thing that I'm really proud of is that we adopted new curriculum, including much needed gifted curriculum. Um, and that was huge. And every time I'm on campus, the gifted teachers still come up and they're, thank you so much for adopting this curriculum. We're so happy we have books to teach out of. So that was a huge thing. Um, one thing that I do want to mention, and, and I briefly talked about it um, when we were talking about the portrait of a graduate, is that this is our school district. Our school district doesn't belong to the Republican Party, and it doesn't belong to the Party. It doesn't belong to a religion or a faction or a group. This is our community. And our community is beautiful, and it's made up of so many different people from so many different backgrounds and so many different beliefs. And that's what makes DVUSD unique. But here's the thing. When people believe what their party or their church or religion or group tell them that's going on in public schools, please come to our school in our district and ask if it's going on here. Because most of the time, you'll find out that it's not. So go to your teacher and go to your principal and go to your district and go to your school board members and ask if X, Y, and Z or A, B, C is being taught there before you make an opinion about what's really happening. President Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. And that is so important. You always want to trust the people that are close to you, that they're telling you the truth, but you want to verify the facts, too. Um, I had some words of wisdom to share for our new board members, but I will save that to personal conversations that I have with them. Um, I've learned a lot in my four years of board service. Um, my kids were here with me earlier, um, and my husband, and they learned a lot too. They were impacted by my board service quite a bit. Um, having students in the district that you're a board member of creates some very unique circumstances. There are more times than I would like to count that I would have to call Dr. Finch or send him a text that says, hey, just a heads up. <laughs> Like, this happened at school today, just in case you hear about it later from a community member or a teacher or an administrator, because not that I needed to do that, but my rule of thumb is, you know, as much as you can give the superintendent a heads up about things, the better off you are. Um, my children have suffered the consequences of my board service. Um, you know, they, they have lost friends. They've been bullied, especially about COVID things. Um, you know, had kids come to school. I heard the reason we have to, wait, to wear masks is because of your mom. You know, stuff like that, that just is, you know, it wasn't called for, but my kids handled it in, in stride. And they, you know, just held their heads up high. Um, and it, they were proud that I was a governing board member. Um, I closed off to a lot of friends and a lot of people because of the things that were being said and written about me online and the really hateful emails I got. So my circle became really small. Um, I'm really tired. I have done a lot of advocating and a lot of fighting and a lot of hard work, but I'm tired. So I'm going to take a couple of weeks and, and refresh and rejuvenate and then be back up to, to help where I'm needed. Um, I've been called a lot of names. I've been called the mean girl of DVUSD, Regina George, lady in waiting, one of Finch's girls, AOC Jr. I'm only the district's cheerleader. I'm a disaster. I'm dumb. I'm a dimwit. 
um, that I'm a slanderer, I'm fake, I'm uncivil, that I bully people in our community who do not agree with me, and I exclude them. I've been called a liar, I've been called dishonest, and I've been called nasty. It's been said that I have evil in my heart, that I'm a liberal used in a derogatory way. I'm anti-American, I'm a rubber stamper. I'm a board member for the free travel. I will destroy all of the good things in the district. I'm clueless and I only regurgitate the information that I'm told with no real information. That I'm a political posturer, that my only qualification for being a board member is that I sleep with a firefighter. That I only vote the way Anne O'Brien tells me to that I harm special needs kids because I was elected, that I'm deceptive and I only use things for my own political gain to push my liberal agenda, that my teaching record is shoddy, my knowledge of special ed is a joke, and I've been accused of committing fraud. I've been accused of creating fake accounts to publicly attack a member of our board, I have been accused of making backdoor deals, of hurting children in our district, that I believe in comprehensive sex education to be taught to kindergartners, and that I won't protect children from being groomed by child predators. I have been accused of being anti-Christian, of gaining personal position, of lying to the community, of ballot harvesting, of victimizing special needs kids by undermining the future study. I've also been accused of pretty much being Asian, which I, because um, apparently all Asians look alike, because quote unquote, uber liberal Julie Reed is at the Scottsdale McSally event. Of course she is buried in, in political posturing, shallow. I've never been to a McSally event. I've also had my personal relationship and walk with Christ called into question. Apparently I'm not a real Christian and I just pretend to serve the Lord and I will have to stand in front of God one day and face him for my stance on things. Here's one of my favorites, quote unquote, wake up. Scottsdale fire captain gets union to pay for wife Julie Reed elected to DVUSD. Her only qualification, sleeping with him. In fact, she's alluded to me sleeping with a fireman four or five times on mine so I'm assuming I must be really good at it. Here's another one. Quote, unquote, God help any child you influence. Between dishonesty, bullying community members, and crooked politics, they will learn bad lessons. Have you gotten a fingerprint clearance card yet? So I'm really thankful my kids are in DVUSD because since I'm such a bad influence, at least I know that they have really good teachers that can you know, shape and change their ways of the things that their mom's teaching them at home. And here's my personal favorite. On 9 10 19, that governing board meeting was held on the anniversary of my mom's death by suicide. I had a board meeting that night. It also happened to be International Suicide Awareness Day. So I mentioned something in my governing board report about um, you know, the importance of mental health and um, making sure that everybody was okay. And the things that you typically talk about when something like that happens to you. And then what was posted online later was, quote unquote, the people this week talking suicide prevention are the very people that treat people in a way that they surrender. My daughter and I were lucky enough to go see To Kill a Mockingbird Sunday Night at Gamut. And I was reminded of this quote from the book. It's never an insult to be called what somebody thinks is a bad name. It just shows you how poor that person is. It doesn't hurt you. And it's true, none of these things really hurt me. They were annoyances and distractions and they made me feel sorry for the person who said them. I tell my kids all the time that hurting people choose to hurt other people's through their words and their actions. People say that in order for you to make it in public service, you need to grow tough skin and they're right. But the consequence of that is that you grow tough skin in all areas, and it's easy to push out all of the good and become out of touch with whom you are serving. Why am I mentioning this and putting it all on the record now? Because I tell my kids that if they see something, they should say something. They should stand up to bullies and stick up for their friends. And really here in DVUSD, we hold our students accountable for their words and behavior and their consequences for bullying. There are consequences written in our Students' Rights and Responsibility Handbook for bullying. However, we live in a double standard society 
And as adults, we show our kids that it's okay to attack, defame, make fun of, and slander other adults without consequence. We are telling our kids to do as we say and not as we do. If I don't stick up for myself and for my friends who are continuously attacked, how can I expect my kids to go to school and do anything? I found some really helpful information on the stopbullying.gov website, and it talks all about what bullying is, what the federal government decides that bullying is, and what cyberbullying is. And those are the things that were happening. And since I've been repeatedly called a mean girl of DVUSD, I'll end it with this from the movie. There are two kinds of evil people in this world, those who do evil stuff and those who see evil stuff being done and don't try to stop it. And that was said by character Janice Ian. I also thought about recreating the Mrs. Norbury speech in the auditorium by saying, raise your hand if you've ever been personally victimized by dot, 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 fill in the blank, but didn't want to stoop to that level. Because in fact, we do have a mean girl and a bully in DVUSD, and it's not me, and she's certainly not hiding. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Reed. So I don't have to say last but not least because Dr. Finch follows me. <laughs> so tonight is um, certainly bittersweet. Um, it's been my honor and privilege to serve this district for the last eight years. Um, I, being up here and helping to make decisions to make this school district a, a better place for our students our families, our community members has truly been a, a privilege. And I think the only thing that helps me to um, not be completely sad about it is that I will get to continue to work with Deer Valley Unified School District in my capacity as a Phoenix City Councilwoman for District 1. So um, I hope that you will still call on me to come visit your classrooms. Uh, I know that at least one teacher will. Um, I was very honored to also get to judge her uh, ed students in last week, and um, they did a great job. And there might have been a winner or two it, that afternoon or that morning when I was there. Um, I'm incredibly proud that my daughter chose to come back and teach in the district that she grew up in, um, even though she knew it would be difficult. And she's done a great job. So, um, Amanda Lewis, I guess I should say, Amanda O'Brien Lewis, I'm incredibly proud of you. Keep um, up the good work. Uh, our kids need to know math. So Mrs. Reed covered many of the highlights. Um, I'm going to cover just a couple more. When I started in the school district, we were cutting budgets. And one thing I am proud to say is that we were not cutting programs. We, we looked other places. And I know we cut into the bone, and that hurt. And we've spent a lot of years trying to recover from that. But I'm happy to say that we've given a lot of raises recently. And so thank you uh, for your work uh, and NST and Jim and everybody. I'm so grateful that we have been able to turn that around and, and give the raises that our staffs deserve. Um, loved helping with Angel Tree and the food boxes, um, the DVEF golf tournaments. Marie Brennan, you are a rock star. Thank you for how you support our district and our family amazing. I'm proud that we have professional learning communities in our district, um, um, our override and our bond, all the new schools we've, we've opened that, uh, you know, buying the land and, and doing the trade for, for Union Park, we didn't know then that TSMC was coming and when we opened Inspiration Mountain, and, and we're going to need those seats for sure. The Barry Goldwater um, Culinary School, the restaurant, oh my gosh, awesome. Uh, going to high school graduations um, and just in general working with all the incredible and extraordinary people here in Deer Valley and the community members that live in this district. Um, I have just a, a little bit of advice for my new board members that I, or for the new board members that I'm not going to save for personal conversation because I think every board member should do this. Schedule a classroom visit or a, a school visit or go to an event um, the week you have a school board meeting. So when you have a rough school board meeting, you can remember why you do this work. And the other thing I'm going to say is that in today's society, 
it is hard sometimes to speak up. But it, even if your voice shakes, you must say something. You, if it's important enough to complain about to somebody, then you have got to take it to the person who can do something about it and have your name attached to it. If it's not worth whatever consequences might come, then it's probably time to move on and quit talking about it. And otherwise, nothing can get done. Anonymous, just we can't just have anonymous complaints. So I please encourage you to speak up, make your voice heard in good times and when things need to be looked at. But I think that Deer Valley Unified School District is the best school district in Arizona, I think I can say that as a school board member. I'm not sure I can say that as a city council person tomorrow because I have a couple other school districts. But I love you all, and it really has been um, my honor and privilege to serve with you. And, and please don't forget about me for school events and when you need judges. So, all right. And it's been a, a true honor to serve with you two ladies. Dr. Finch. I thought when you were talking, Ms. Reed, about you being attacked by a board member, I thought you were talking about me. Um, I have boxes of those same attacks. If I may read uh, a gentleman in history, I might surmise that this was given to me 20 years ago and it sits in my uh, abode, um, and it reminds me, if I were to try to read, much less answer all of the attacks made on me, this shop might as well be closed for any other business. I do the best I know how, the very best I can, and I mean to keep doing it, doing so until the end of my term, fill that in. If the end brings me out all right, what is said about me won't amount to anything. If the end bring, bring, brings me out wrong, 10 angels swearing I was right would make no difference. That's from Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln who obviously had a rough road as well. Uh, but I um, we just wanted to thank you both, again, for staying true to yourself. These positions are obviously not paid, and they are um, highly scrutinized. And um, you can, you're can you always making 50% of the people mad, no matter what you do. And that's uh, part of the gig, comes with it. And you guys did a great job. Always wanting to know new information, want to know why, the history, uh, Deer Valley, the Deer Valley way, you want to learn all that and so you can make better decisions over time. And, and so I want, to, I want to thank you for that, uh, all that time and those attacks that I know came to you and your family and your kids. And, um, but uh, you kept your chin up every time and represented Deer Valley well, so I appreciate that. So uh, don't go too far. I might call you out of retirement in a couple of years, so... Go ahead and get yourself refreshed, Ms. Reed. You give, I'll give you three weeks. But uh, on the school side, I just want to thank all the teams. I mean, literally hundreds of people, thousands of hours went into our strategic plan, our futures report, our NSD uh, work. Um, those are, the, the, the strategic plan is a community plan. It's, uh, it's not, it lives over three school boards. Um, it's something that is developed by our community. It's not, it's not, uh, hostage to one board or another. So I'm really proud of our community uh, pitching in and giving us that. And then obviously the futures, it's taken a lot of team members to continue to march this forward. We're a long ways away, but we're about midstream on this project. And uh, again, I wanna thank the NST teams that put in the OT to get this stuff uh, done for today. So just in case, if the rumor mill is correct, the governor has next week or this week and next week to get the job done, oh, we are, I'm also calling on him to uh, hold up his handshake. He took, he shook a hand, a hand four hands to be exact, and uh, those four people um, made a deal with him, and that's how he got his budget passed. Mm -hmm. And now he wants to change, change the deal. So we want to make sure that uh, yeah, he didn't have his fingers crossed in his pocket. We want to thank again, Marie. Great job on the bingo night. That was a smash. Even though I, you know, didn't mess up the numbers too bad, uh, the, it was the community really loved it. I just found out this morning that uh, Boulder Creek High School, uh, their uh, one of the classes won the stock market game. 
again for the fourth time in a row. That's four state championships in a row. Pretty impressive. We call that a d dynasty. That'd be like the Lake Yankees or the or the uh, Lakers. I don't think it would be the Cardinals, but last but not least, we have to we want to obviously enjoy our break, get recharged, get fired back up for another uh, second half of the school year here. January 2nd is our PD day, and on 3rd, uh, the students come back. So um, again, I want to thank uh, the board members heading out and welcome the new board members coming in as we continue to shape us. And we also want to speak special extra thanks to those that are sticking around. <laughs> Yes, Ms. Orby, we will dedicate a day to you somewhere in there. Diet pep, uh, Dr. Pepper or something cool. Fully loaded. That's my report. Thank you. All right. I hope everybody has very happy holidays and a wonderful and blessed new year. With that, for the last time, future board meetings are posted, and I would take a motion so to moved. adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those say aye. 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 Any that say nay get to stay. Aye.